All right, we're gonna move on now from the chest to the colon. And uh, Dr. Jason Frischer, who is uh, the head of the colorectal center at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, is gonna talk to us about Hirschsprungs. And these are gonna be rapid fire. So five minutes on Hirschsprungs, five minutes on imperfect anus, and five minutes on rectal prolapse. I recall having a full day of a Hirschsprung's webcast, and now I get five minutes. Now you get so. five minutes. Take the whole day, put it into five minutes. Basically, what are the key questions? All right, excellent. So I have a couple of patient presentations to do. The first one's a simple, just to get a poll of the audience. So a newborn with increased abdominal distension, not tolerating feeds, and hasn't passed meconium, you get a contrast study with whatever material you want to use, and it's demonstrated on the screen. What, how would you proceed? Would you proceed with a laparoscopic, and you get a um, suction rectal biopsy that demonstrates no ganglion cells, hypertrophic nerves, and abnormal ACE staining. So you have confirmation of Hirschsprung's disease. With this contrast enema, would you do lapros laparoscopic biopsies, mobilization of the colon and a transanal technique? Would you do a transanal dissection and then only go to laparoscopy or laparotomy if needed? Would you do an open biopsy and mobilization of the colon? Or would you do a leveling colostomy or some other technique you may have developed? How about in the audience? Mark, what would you do in a, with this contrast enema? Uh, I'd do a laparoscopic biopsy and a pull through. In laparoscopic mobilization? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mac, what, same. What happens if it showed a more standard rectosigmoid? I think this is a higher, it's, a higher it's lesion, almost yeah. like at the descending colon same. where is the transition. But if it was a rectosigmoid lesion that you think you could reach from below, would you still do laparoscopy or would you start transanally? I would. No, I'd still do laparoscopy because I think you can be fooled. Same. Uh, so Up. I think that, I mean, Jason, you're more of an expert at colorectal disease than I am, and there are two or three others around our country, but for the standard average pediatric surgeon, if you just do the transanal, if, if you just do the transanal one to begin with, you're going to one in 10 times or so, or one in 15 times, sometime in your career, you're going to find one that's higher than you wanted or a total colon. And then you're going to have the colon in your hands and not know what to do with it. So I, I just want to put that out there. Yeah, it's not going to happen very often, but it will probably happen in your career at some point. And so if you're going to do the transanal without a biopsy, just figure out what you're going to do in that situation. And you know this more than I do, but you're an expert and, and I'm just a, an average practicing yeah, right. pediatric surgeon. I, I, Dr. Holcomb, I appreciate your comments and I, I agree with you. I Every time that I do a primary transanal, I get, I tighten up a little bit to make sure that I'm confident that I can do and I have an exit strategy in mind if I get in trouble. Um, but the safe way to do this is some sort of biopsy, whether you do it laparoscopically or a laparoscopic mobilization, maybe due to biopsy through the umbilicus if you want to get a nice full thickness biopsy. Whatever your technique or trick is, that's certainly the safest way so, to go. So Jason, I, um, I was noticing on the poll, almost 30% of the folks in the audience are going to do a leveling colostomy. So you can comment on that. I think... Uh, I think that's a safe thing to do. It depends on what pathologist, your pathology at your home institution, if you have concern about your pathologist, if you don't have someone comfortable reading um, for Hirschsprung's disease, uh, that might be the safest thing to do. I know people who go on mission trips and trips where you don't have pathologists, it's a almost a three-stage type procedure to do that. So. I, our audience is diverse, and so it so might be, we, depend where they're coming from. Let's ask those who answered leveling colostomy if you could leave a comment on, on, on why you chose that. I just want to make one comment that Belinda and I talked about, and, and uh, is that I, I don't believe that a tr pure transanal is necessarily less invasive. In other words, I believe that putting three incisions on the abdomen is actually less invasive in my hands, in my hands, certainly not in your guys' hands, but in my hands. I'm going to be torquing in that anal canal much more than if I had done it laparoscopically and freed everything up from uh, the abdominal approach. I think this is just like anything yeah, else. Belinda, go ahead. It depends on your comfort level. I mean, we've yeah, talked we about talk this about. before. Yeah. You know, I've, 
with the transanal trying to get high past the pelvic reflection, you're you're pulling and you're stretching. So right. if you're comfortable with that, right. then okay. Exactly. But um, I think if it's beyond that, then you're going to do laparoscopy or laparotomy if you, mm -hmm. you're not laparoscopy. And Belinda and I talk about this a lot, and it's about a comfort level. And how fit we, I take, I watch the clock how long I'm doing a transanal dissection because I do not want to be stretching on those sphincters for four hours trying to dig right. up yeah. in a dark hole when I could put a scope in. I easily put three, three millimeter ports in and mobilize laparoscopically in 45 minutes or so and so, so why get the not? same. I mean, what's, what, so because I could do it from the bottom in the same time frame if it's a nice standard rectosigmoid. It's right you can get it done in a couple hours. Right. I mean, if you know where your level is, this, this, I and mean, if you have I a good contrast study, the, I think you know The image on at. the screen I would do with laparoscopy without question. But a standard rectosigmoid, six, eight, ten centimeters up, I could do transanal in the same time frame. Okay. We, did we cut you off? Were you going to say yeah. something? Okay. So that was not controversial at all, and I'm gonna, uh, that was the simple question. Now I wanted to go on to complications a little bit. And this is the, the patient population I really enjoy taking care of, and I think that pediatric surgeons need to be aggressive at caring for these patients because they are our patients, and I think we know what's, how to help them best. And so patients who have complications after Hirschsprung's disease, we sort of put into two piles. They either have obstructive symptoms and things like enterocolitis, failure to thrive, abdominal distension, or they have soiling issues, and then divide them into true incontinence and pseudo-incontinence. And then the patients with obstructive symptoms, you have to discern whether it's an anatomic problem or a pathologic problem. And soiling, like I said, you have to discern whether it's true fecal incontinence, and that could be due to injury to the sphincter, injury to the dentate line, or pseudo incontinence. Is there a, a constipation issue causing the incontinence? This is a, I include this in the slides, and I'm not going to go over it. I think Jack Langer published this in a paper. Um, a few years ago, this algorithm, which really does a nice job of describing how to work up patients with, um, with problems after Hirschsprung's disease. The workup I, I include includes a contrast enema, water soluble, and then an exam under anesthesia, looking for the listed items uh, below, which is dentate line, stricture, stretch sphincter, um, looking for twists, and then I, if I don't find a reason for the patient having